Thank you, for Alan, for that reading. I appreciate it. Again, I always want to recognize the opportunity that's been given to me, and it's a, it's a blessing, but it's also a great challenge because when you present God's Word, it must be done in accordance with and appropriately according to His will. And we're certainly honored to be able to do that tonight. I think most of us realize that in this life we make different kinds of investments. Some people invest in their profession as far as learning and knowing how to do that. Some uh, invest in becoming a, a professional at some thing or another. But there's an investment that we all need to take heed of and understand and learn from. Tonight I want us to speak a little bit, and I've spoken before about the cost of discipleship. I've, talk, I've spoken before about different ways and things that it costs us when we are truly a disciple of the Lord. But the cost of discipleship is undoubtedly the most enormous investment that we'll ever make in this world. But just because it's an enormous investment, we have to realize that it is also the wisest investment that we can ever make. It's the most profitable investment that we can ever make. And so therefore, we need to take heed to the very words of Jesus when he tells us about how we can invest in such a way as to have eternal salvation. For the last several times that I've been able to speak to you, we've been taking the life of Jesus and we, we talked about his birth, we talked about his childhood, we talked about different things about him. But tonight I want us to think about the cost of discipleship as we find it in the pages of the New Testament. And so as we go and we hear the very words of Jesus found there in Matthew chapter 16, beginning in verse 24, where Alan just read for us, it says, Then Jesus said unto his disciples, If any will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Whosoever shall save his life shall lose it, and whosoever shall lose his life for my sake shall find it. For whatsoever a man, for what is, does a man profiteth, if he shall gain the whole world, but lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? And so you see the importance of this, how that we have to invest in our own life to be faithful, to be able to have our soul saved. And so we need to be careful about the things that we do. And so as we look in the New Testament and we look at the four Gospels, we find Jesus teaching the very meaning about the cost of discipleship. All throughout those pages, he reflects to us different ways and different things that he's teaching about what it's going to cost for a person to be a disciple of his. And in Luke chapters 12, 13, and 14, we find the basis of our lesson tonight. Jesus explains to us, and he expands upon this enormous subject, this investment that each one of us is going to have to make. I cannot invest for you, nor can you invest for me. Certainly, we can help and encourage one another, but each person, as Philippians 2 and verse 12 says, is going to have to work out their own salvation with fear and with trembling. And so, therefore, it behooves each and every one of us to think about these things. Upon research, I realized and I found within a book called The Cost of Discipleship, and the writer makes this statement. When, he, when Christ calls a man, he says, he bids him to come and die. The writer of that book, Brother Dietrich Bonhoeffer, explains the statement in this way, and I quote, cheap grace is grace we bestow upon ourselves. Preaching uh, for forgiveness without requiring repentance, baptism without church discipline, communion without confession, cheap grace is grace without discipleship. He goes on to say, costly grace is the gospel which must be sought 
again and again. The gift must be asked for, the door at which a man must knock. It is costly because it costs a man his life, and it is grace because it gives a man only the only true life. And so when we go and we realize what the Lord has offered unto us, and we see within his invitation to discipleship, when we study that carefully, that statement seems to be correct because it is not cheap. It cost man something. Popular religion today, and I guess throughout the entire world and throughout our lifetime, has diluted the message of Christ and has blinded multitudes of people. It has blinded them from the very true meaning of what divine grace really is. What that is uh, brought to our eyes through the pages of the New Testament. And we realize even in the Old Testament where we learn, as Romans 15 and verse 4 says, that it's there for our learning, it's for an example for us. When we see how God deals with his people and when he says something, he means it, he requires it, and we cannot deviate from that. So we find on one hand, we have these group of people, uh, really one religion, has proclaimed the system of works and sacraments. In other words, they lead blindly the people, the church members, and they tell them that just because you do these works and you do these kinds of actions that they require of you, that there's a way that you can attain salvation without really following after Jesus. You just do what they say and you'll be fine. And then we find on the other hand, and this is a reaction to the abuse uh, of the gospel by the Catholic religion, the Protestant churches have said so many times and they proclaim uh, salvation of cheap grace. And I mean by that, that kind of grace which requires almost nothing of the believers. They say faith only, only believe and you'll have it made. I would assume that most of us, if not all of us, at least that are old enough to pay attention to and watch uh, television shows and things like that, over the last several months, we've seen numerous times men get on the TV and be, it's because of the hurricanes and the natural disasters that have happened and they're going about and they're speaking and they're saying to people, if you believe in Jesus and you accept him in your heart and you pray this little prayer, then he'll come into your heart and you'll be saved. Friends, that's not the truth. That's not the gospel. And so they're leading people astray. They may do great works as, as a, as a, in a physical sense by doing humani humanitarian things, helping and aiding people, and they're doing a great work in that, but they're damning people's souls because of the information that they're teaching about the gospel and how you are saved and that grace that comes with that. Neither of these positions are reflective or represent the truth of the gospel. Both are deceptive, counterfeits. They're telling people lies. And you say, well, why would someone do that? Well, if you'll look on, on the other hand, so to speak, or you'll look at the back side of that coin, and, and it reflects to my mind, you say, think about 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 8, where it says, Our adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. People with a good conscience can do things wrong. And so today or tonight, we want to look at the cost of discipleship that's given in the words of Christ himself. Remember what Christ said there in John chapter 8, beginning in verse 31. He said, Jesus said to those Jews which believed on him, If ye continue in my word, then ye are my disciples indeed. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. And so tonight, we want to look at these very words, particularly as he speaks on discipleship in the Gospel of Luke, chapters 12, 13, and 14. So first of all, as we begin, let's notice first the very words that he speaks to us and that are recorded for us in Luke chapter 12, beginning in verse number 1. It says, In the meantime, when there were gathered together an innumerable multitude of people, insomuch that they trod upon one another, 
he began to say unto his disciples, first of all, Beware ye of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. For there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed, neither hid that shall not be known. Therefore, whatsoever ye have spoken in darkness shall be heard in the light. And that ye which ye have spoken in the ear in closets shall be proclaimed from the housetops. And I say unto you, my friends, be not afraid of them that can kill the body, and after that have no more that they can do. But I will forewarn you whom you shall fear. Fear him which after he hath killed hath power to cast into hell. Yea, I say unto you, fear him. These are the very words that Jesus spoke to his disciples. And as we look at those, the religion of the Pharisees was, among other things, one of show and pretense. It was one that had, uh, we might say, of great pomp and circumstance. They did things so people could know that they were religious in that sense. They loved to pray on the corners in the marketplaces, we're told. And the Bible tells us that they loved to do that for what purpose? To be seen of men. They wanted people to recognize them as spiritual and holy or righteous. And they wore special forms of dress. They did this to impress people with their great piety. They did this so people could see and know that they were religious in their very nature that they would speak about or the things that they wanted people to know about them. We're told also that they loved the chief seats at the temple in the times of the religious feast. And so you see there are just a few things. The idea comes to mind that these were done to be seen of men, not because they were truly trying to follow after God, because their hearts were not in the right place. And I know that because the very words of Jesus that are found in Matthew chapter 23, Jesus called such showy religion, such things like that, he called them hypocrisy. And so hypocrisy is not to be found in the Christian life. We should be living appropriately. Outward forms, however impressive they may be, are no substitute for purity of heart. Outward appearances are no substitute for the hu hum uh, humility in spirit. Outward things are not substitute for mercy or for love or for compassion and service to those that are in need. And so there needs to be that, even in the smallest of ways. People can help other people in multitudes of ways. And there's a, a list that we could stand and enumerate for a long, long time. But you see, the biggest fair, uh, problem here, the failure of those pharisaical uh, religion, was that it was directed toward men and not from the inward spirit toward God. They were trying to be seen of men and not trying to worship in the right way. And so the lesson which every Christian needs to learn is that all of our worship and all of our service to God, if it's going to be acceptable, it has to be that it must be directed single-heartedly and wholeheartedly toward God. That's what our worship needs to be. So God reads the hearts of men. I cannot read the hearts of men, neither can you read the hearts of men. God also reads the motives why people do the things that they do. I can't read those motives for someone else. I sometimes don't even know what my own motives is, it seems like. Humanity has a hard time knowing exactly why we do what we do. But God knows all of those things. And so he knows if the motives that you are driven to do something by is real and for the purpose of worshiping him truly, or if it's just to be seen of men or seen by someone who might think that you are spiritual in that sense. And so he knows perfectly why we do what we do. 
I'm going to be honest with you. Sometimes I don't know why I do what I do. Sometimes I say, why did I do that? I don't know if you're the same way, but I would think that many people are like that. So we don't know, but God knows why we do the things we do. And so we need to mold our hearts to love him and to, to care for the things that he has instructed us to do. If our service is not rendered wholeheartedly, single-heartedly unto him, then the Bible tells us that our service is in vain. It's not going to be pleasing unto him. Now, the physical things that we do to help people and stuff like that, those are one thing. But I'm talking about in service to God. And so in connection with this sin, Jesus proceeds to warn against the materialistic attitude that people seem to have. In Luke chapter 12 and verse 33, I mean verse 13, we read these words. And one of the company said unto him, Master, speak to my brother that he divide the inheritance with me. And he said unto him, Man, who made me a judge or divider over you? And he said unto them, Take heed and beware of covetousness. covetousness. For a man's life consisteth not of the abundance of the things which he possesseth. Luke chapter 12, verses 13 through 15. So a common human failure is to decide man's worth on the basis of material wealth on the basis of possessions that they may have. And so a person may have lots of things as far as wealth goes and personal items and property and possessions in some way. And many times, because people are wealthy, they receive special advantages. They receive special consideration because they have attained a certain amount of wealth or possessions. But... There's no such place in true religion for that. For the, in the religion that Jesus Christ established through his kingdom, there's no place for that. Jesus taught us that each soul is equal and wor worth, of, of equal worth, I should say, in the sight of the Lord, in the sight of God. It doesn't matter what economic status you possess. It doesn't matter what social position you have. It doesn't matter to God. What matters to God is what your heart is. And so there's an investment there to make our hearts to reflect that which the Word of God would be pleasing and uh, with. And so whatever position you might have, how do I know that? Well, when you go to Galatians chapter 3 and verse 28, and then go to Romans chapter 2 and verse number 11. And so we must all possess the same sense of value because God looks at it that way. And for us to be true disciples of the Lord, we must possess the same sense of values that we find recorded for us. Jesus, Jesus used this very occasion to teach a parable concerning the rich farmer. Again, in Luke chapter 12, beginning in verse 16. And it says there, and he spake a parable, that's Jesus speaking a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentiful, and he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do, because I have no room where to bestow my fruits? And he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns, and I will build greater, and there, will be, and there I will bestow my fruits and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, thou hast much good laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said unto him, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then, those, then whose shall these things be which thou hast provided? So is he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. And then we go down a few verses later, all the way down to verse number 34. And this is the conclusion that Jesus brings to this thought process. He said, for where your treasure is, there your heart be also. The very words of Jesus. And for most of us, the words of Jesus provide a real test of our discipleship. Too often, you see, our actions betray our profession. The profession that we have accepted by living after and following after 
the very Word of God. You see, we claim to be following Christ. We claim to be seeking God's kingdom first, and yet we actually act like the world when it comes to material values. We search and seek after those more than enjoying the pleasures that Christ has given us. And so our treasure is in earthly material things rather than those which pertain to Christ and his kingdom. So we need to be on guard and be watchful about that. So this enormous investment that we are making, we should apply to ourselves and not become materialistic and not be the kinds of persons that want people to see us for our religion rather than to see the good that we do. And they will realize that we live differently than the rest of the world. And then secondly, the cost of discipleship can also be determined on the basis of our human relationships. We need to consider the words that Christ gave for us in Luke chapter 12, beginning in verse 51. He says, suppose I come to give peace on earth, I tell you nay, but rather division. For henceforth there shall be five in one house divided, three against two and two against three. The father shall be divided against the son and the son against the father. The mother against the daughter and the daughter against the mother. The mother-in-law against the daughter-in-law and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. Sadly, discipleship can sometimes cost us our families. Truly, it is God's will that families be united in his service. That's what God's plan and his design was. But he also gave into each one a personal responsibility and a freedom of choice where they can make their own choices and make their own decisions as they go through their life. And so sometimes being united in the service of God cannot always be the case. Following Christ, though, is basically a personal choice. Each one of us has to make for themselves. Again, I cannot make that for you, nor can you make that for me. We can certainly help and encourage one another. And whenever the choice that someone makes conflicts with that of other members of our household, then the followers of Christ must be prepared to accept the consequences. That's a hard choice, but that's what the Bible teaches us. Oftentimes, a husband or a wife must go it alone, as we refer to in his or her service to Christ. They try to make the best of a bad situation because they don't have the strength and support. And I'm here to tell you tonight, I don't even know how that would even feel because I have a wonderful wife that loves and supports the Word of God and supports me as I strive to support that, and it is a wonderful blessing. And so as we think about those things, we realize that some people are in a bad situation. Sometimes it is that a child must choose Christ over their parents. And sometimes the parents must choose Christ over their children. And so, above all things, we need to serve God and we need to serve Christ and His commandments. And so we can be separated from those that we love, and it's not a, a union of service together as the family. And so those human relationships are very, very tough, but the Bible is specific about the things that we should and should not do. We need to remember this, one soul gained for Christ and his kingdom is worth a lifetime of effort, and it's worth a lifetime of investment to reach and attain the effort that we're putting forth. And finally, being a true follower of Christ requires a substantial investment in one's time and talents and resources. And I'm sure there's times when people, when they hear these things, say, well, he always going to get around to the thing about we need to give of our money, we need to give of our means, and, thus, and those are true things that we need to think about. But you see, because of our love and our deep gratitude for what God has done for us, we desire to give him first place in our lives. And that's with all things, to be 
first in our lives is what God seeks after. He says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. We'll receive the things that we need if we serve God. I'm not saying you're going to receive the things you want. People want many more. Remember what we talked about at first, about the material things? So each day of the week, we should devote primarily our lives to Christ and to serving him, to living as we go out in the world and as we work and as we labor and as we uh, are among people, that we let our light shine by the way we live, the way we act, the way we talk, and the way we treat people. That is an investment that we need to make. And we do that in honor of him, the one that rose from the dead after giving his life for our sins upon the cross. We gather together to observe a memorial feast unto him. The great event of history, the greatest event of all historical events. And since we are members of his spiritual body, we do our utmost to be present each time that the doors are open. Each time we have an opportunity to assemble together, to edify one another, to learn from God's word, to be familiar one with another, we need to be prepared to be there and present ourselves and show ourselves, not because of pride or arrogance or for someone to say, oh, well, they are so holy or they're so righteous, but because of the love that God has shown unto us. And it's not only on the first day of the week, but every day that we live, there should be uh, work that we are doing. There is things that we can do, things that we should do each and every day in the service of God uh, uh, and render those things to the Lord's service. Luke records for us in Acts chapter 10 and verse 38 that Jesus continued what? He continually what? He went about doing good. An example that Jesus set for us to go about doing good. And if we truly believe the words of God that we should follow in his footsteps, therefore the, the normal conclusion would be that we would desire to go about doing good to other people. And so when we as faithful disciples of Jesus follow in his steps, we do strive to go about doing good. And the Apostle Paul stated these words, And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. And we have therefore opportunity, or as we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them that are of the household of faith. Galatians chapter 6, verse 9 and verse number 10. And so how thrilling it is. And I can tell you from firsthand experience, it is a joyous and thrilling time to, when you look about and you see Christians out on the move, doing things, helping people, doing all kinds of good works and good things for people. And in the opportunity that they have to do that, they are teaching and edifying and showing the love of God to them, not only in the physical things they're helping them with, but also in the words that can strengthen them. And when you see people doing that, it is such a blessing. And there's still others. And because someone might say, well, I, I don't have the physical ability to do that. There are so many things that a person can do. I guess one of my pet peeves is when someone says, well, you know, uh, they're not providing me with opportunities to do things. Friends, if you read the Bible, there's opportunity after opportunity after opportunity for Christians to go about and do things and to help people. Why should you have to have someone to set up a, a, a certain program just so you'll do that for a time or two and then not do it any longer? But you need to be out working and doing those things because there's people that make phone calls. There's people that pick up those cards out there and, and deliver cards to people, encouraging words, things of that nature. There's people that's out there encouraging the weak. There are people that's out there conducting home Bible studies. And sometimes people set up Bible studies so others might be able to conduct those home Bible studies. Others are busy throughout the week 
And I think this is something that's neglected sometimes. There are people that are throughout the week are studying and preparing lessons to be able to teach, to ad ad admonish people and to teach people the Word of God, to instruct them on how that they should live their lives so that they can have eternal salvation. And so the church can receive those words because of their preparation that they are making. Those that teach Bible classes prepare those lessons. It takes time to do that. It takes effort to do that. And we ought to be doing that. And those, there are always people in need of edification. Each and every one of us need that. Some specialize in Christian hospitality. They just have a, a, a knack for that. And so there's many, many different works. And you can see there are literally hundreds of ways which we can serve and be a blessing to others. Jesus said these words, Whosoever give a cup of cold water in my name as a disciple of mine, he shall not lose his reward. Mark chapter 9 and verse number 41. Giving, helping, serving, three key words, which I think sum up quite fairly the essence of true discipleship. Those who have honestly pursued this path, path will tell you it's the most joyful and rewarding path possible. It's not to say that we don't make mistakes. We sin and we fall short of the glory of God, but those striving to live that way, people recognize that. I believe there's no greater happiness nor peace that can be had than the joy and the peace of being a faithful, devoted follower of Jesus. And yes, I'd be the first to tell you, it is an enormous investment. It's an enormous amount of work. It causes us to reflect daily on the things that we do. But the rewards and the blessing by comparison make the cost seem like it's nothing. It's really that way in that sense. There's a song, it's an old song, and I remember singing it uh, many years ago. I don't know that I've sang it in a long time. And it, within that song, it says, Then the toils of the road will seem nothing when I get to the end of the way. Think about those words. When we get to the end of the way, what are the words we're going to hear? Are we going to hear, Depart from me, ye that work iniquity, for I never knew thee? Or are you going to hear, Enter in, thy good and faithful servant. Those are the words that we desire to hear. The Apostle Paul, when he was converted, died to his former life as the Saul of Tarsus. And he gave up everything which could not be used for the glory of Christ. Paul was an educated man. He was a respected man. He, he had a, a, an influence and he had a position in society, so to speak. But he gave all of that up that wasn't useful for the cause of Christ. And he tells us what discipleship meant in his life. Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ. He wrote, nevertheless, I live. Yet it is no longer I, but Christ that lives in me. And the life in which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Galatians 2 and verse number 20. So I ask you the question, has your self-will been crucified with Christ? If not, you now have the opportunity to die to sin, to worldly things, and let Christ reign in your life by faith and obedience to his will. The Bible tells us that you have to hear the word of God. He says, because faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God, Romans 10, verse 17. Must believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, John 8 and verse 24. You must repent of your sins, Luke 13, verse 3 and verse 5. It says if you don't, you're going to perish. And then you must confess his name before men. Jesus said, whosoever confess me before men, him will I also confess before my Father, which is in heaven. Verse 33 says, but if you don't confess, I'm not going to confess you. And so therefore, we confess his name. And then at that point, we are ready then that we have an opportunity because we followed through with the things we need to get to to then be baptized 
into Jesus Christ. And we're baptized in Acts 2.38 for the forgiveness of our sins. And then we go on and to live our lives. If you've not done that, then you need to consider the things and make the investment in your life. But the cost of discipleship is real and it's there. But it's the greatest cost and the, the best and the wisest decision that you will ever make. If you're a Christian and yet you've not really been living your life in such a way, you've kind of slacked off of your duty, you need to repent. If perhaps the thought of thy heart might be forgiven thee, and he will forgive you, he's faithful and just to do that. That's uh, Acts 8, verse 22, and 1 John chapter 1, and verse 9. So if the opportunity that you have right now, and you meet any of these qualifications for needing help, needing to be baptized, needing to be brought into the Lord's church, because he will add you to that if you truly do the things that he requires of you, or if you're a Christian and you just need the help and the prayers of the church in some way, the opportunity is yours and the time is now. Won't you come as together we stand and sing?